In this video, we're going to get down to the nitty-gritty of the applications of partial derivatives to thermodynamic systems. Woohoo! Things are going to get a little bit complicated here, so bear with me and ask lots of questions. We'll start with some basic definitions. Consider a function, f, um, dependent on two variables, x and y. We can accommodate changes in f represented by the differential df by using the partial derivatives with respect to x and y. This partial derivative here shows the effect of changes in x on the function y, df dx. The subscript y actually represents the fact that we're holding y constant while looking at these changes. Multiplied by the differential dx means that if we multiply the rate of change with respect to x, df dx, by the change in x, we're going to get the change in the function f that occurs when x changes. The second term in this function does the same thing. In this case, df dy represents how f changes when we change y, holding x constant. And then, of course, we're multiplying it by the differential dy. So the sum of these two differentials um, actually gives us the total change of f that occurs when we change x and when we change y. It's just a simple mathematical definition. Now we look at how this applies to the thermodynamic function and for internal energy. In this case, um, we have met thus far three variables in our system, pressure, volume, and temperature, uh, but because two of those variables are independent and one's dependent, we only need to write our function in terms of two variables. In this case, we choose volume and temperature. We're not choosing pressure simply because it will turn out that writing internal energy as a function of volume and temperature will be more convenient for most of our applications. So here we see the direct relationship where what we've done is we replaced f, the function f, with the internal energy function u, and we've replaced x with volume and y with temperature. So du dv, a constant t, represents changes in internal energy when the volume changes holding the temperature constant, and du dt here, constant v, shows how internal energy changes when we change the temperature, holding the volume constant. Now, what's important to note here is what we're going to do is be relating these partial derivatives to changes in physical variables that occur when we measure things in the lab. We will therefore ascribe meaning to each of these partial derivatives. The partial derivative du dt constant v, we've actually already seen. We've talked about this in a previous video from chapter 2. That is nothing more than the constant volume heat capacity. Go back and take a look at that, take a look at the text, and you'll recognize that as a constant volume heat capacity. So we are relating that partial derivative to that physical quantity constant volume heat capacity. The derivative du dv a constant t, however, is something that we haven't seen before. Again, that represents changes in internal energy when we change the volume, but for isothermal situations because the temperature is held constant. We're going to represent this with the symbol pi um, and use the subscript t to represent the fact that it's isothermal. Um, if you take a look at this and just do a, a simple analysis, dimensional analysis, you'll find that this partial derivative, which is energy divided by volume, has the same units as pressure, and we're going to call this internal pressure. This is something that is associated with interactions within the system. Uh, we'll talk more about this later. Um, and, but if we think about an ideal gas, for an isothermal process, we go back to what we talked about earlier, uh, for an ideal gas, then we remember that delta U for any isothermal process is equal to zero. Uh, let me reiterate, this is something that we will always assume to be the case for an ideal gas, that delta U is equal to zero when the temperature is constant. And that therefore means that the internal pressure 
for an ideal gas will always be equal to zero. So again, remember that. Internal pressure for an ideal gas is going to be equal to zero. And that again is because an ideal gas has no interactions. Another important property of these thermodynamic functions like internal energy and enthalpy, um, as we noted earlier, is that they are functions of state and independent path. In situations like that, um, it's important to note that the order of differentiation is unimportant. So again, if we go back to our situation where we had a function f that depend on variables x and y, we will note that it doesn't matter whether we take the derivative with respect to y first. So in this case on the left, we have first the derivative of f with respect to y, and then we take the derivative of that with respect to x. Because we're independent of path in these functions of state, that's going to be the same thing as a situation where we first take the derivative with respect to x and then take the derivative with respect to y. Another way to write this in terms of second derivatives is d, d2f dx dy is equal to second derivative of f dy dx. This will always be the case for functions of state. Um, this will actually be important later in the semester when we do some additional derivations. <laughs> Applying the same rules to internal energy, which is a function of both volume and temperature, we'll note that we can re uh, change the order of differentiation. So here we have on the right, uh, we'll note we're first taking the derivative with respect to temperature, and on the uh, excuse me, on the left we have the derivative with respect to temperature and on the right we have the derivative with respect to volume. Um, we're just simply again changing the order of differentiation but again because internal energy does not depend on path the order of differentiation does not matter. We'll of course recognize here that the derivative on the left um, is, the constant, is the heat constant volume heat capacity and the derivative on the right is the, cons is the internal energy. And what that means then is that if we ask a simple question, how does the constant volume heat capacity change when we change volume, then we'll note that the change in, in heat capacity with respect to volume is equal to the change in internal energy with respect to temperature. So for an ideal gas, what does that mean? Well, for an ideal gas, the internal pressure is equal to zero and therefore for an ideal gas because the internal pressure is equal to zero the derivative is equal to zero and that means for an ideal gas the heat capacity does not change when we change the volume under isothermal conditions. Let me repeat that. For an ideal gas the constant volume heat capacity will not change with the change in volume. That means though with systems that have real interactions, the constant volume heat capacity may change when we change the volume. This is something to keep in mind in later calculations. Alright, another very important uh, property of the partial derivatives is considering a system of three variables x, y, and z um, is this product of partial derivatives that we see here. Um, dx dy at constant z times dy dz at constant x times dz dx at constant y, that product of those three partial derivatives is equal to negative one. You'll notice there's a pattern here that if we go from the first um, partial derivative to the second derivative, we're going to take dy to the top we're going to take our constant dz to the bottom, dz, and then the x um, becomes the constant. We go on and we'll see the same thing as we go from the second partial to the third. The z goes to the top, the x goes to the bottom, and the y becomes a constant. There is a general pattern here that, that um, should be relatively simple to, to remember um, x, y, 
z, then y, z, x, and then z, x, y. Now we just simply apply these rules to internal energy um, where our three variables are u, v, and t. Um, and we'll know the same pattern here um, as we go through this. Um, the first derivative, u, d, u, d, v, a constant t, um, the v goes to the top, and the next derivative, the t goes to the bottom, and then u goes to the constant. And we see the same thing as we go to the third, t goes to the top, uh, u goes to the bottom, and v goes to the constant. So we have this simple expression here, which sets that set of three derivatives um, equal to negative 1. Now, partial derivatives actually can manip be manipulated in ways very similar to algebraic quantities. Um, so we can isolate this du dv a constant t over here on the left side of the equation by, of course, dividing both sides by the other two partial derivatives. Well, it turns out that if we divide both sides by the other partial derivatives, um, and let me just rewrite that over here on the side, Uh, we'll see that this is, of course, the expression that we get when we divide through by this partial derivatives. But just like fractions, if we have a fraction in a, in a uh, denominator, um, then we can simply flip the fraction and move it up to the, to the numerator. So we'll notice here we've got dv dt, a constant u in the denominator. So if we just flip that, that is, again, equivalent to the situation where dv dt a constant u is equal to, uh, flipping that gives us d, d, dt dv a constant u. So you'll notice all we've done is flip that, and the same thing would obviously be true for dt du a constant v. Um, we simply flip that and bring it up into the numerator. So we end up with this expression here that equates du dv a constant t. So the question is, why do we care? Well, first of all, we care because this is just a lot of fun. Uh, but secondly, this is going to help us to get a handle on this du dv a constant t, uh, which you may recall um, was equal to this internal pressure quantity that we discussed earlier. So if we want to get a handle on this internal pressure, which of course for ideal gases is equal to zero, but for real gases and real substances, uh, interactions mean that it's non-zero. If we want to get a handle on it, we want to measure it, we've got to find a way to measure it because you just don't measure energy in the lab. You measure things like temperature and volume and pressure in the lab. Um, so if we take a look at what we've got here, of course, when we look at these terms, um, we will note that du dt a constant v is equal to the constant volume heat capacity. Uh, so that's something we can measure in the lab. We can measure constant volume heat capacities. And then we're left with this other term here, d dt, dt dv a constant u. Well, we can measure temperature, and we can measure volume. So if we can uh, set up an experiment, which we'll talk about in the next video, if we can set up an experiment which measures temperature and volume, under conditions of constant internal energy. So we're measuring temperature changes, we're measuring volume changes for a process where the internal energy doesn't change. If we can make those measurements, then we can calculate and determine what this partial derivative is. And if we can determine that partial derivative, dt dv constant u, then we can determine what our internal pressure would be. So again, let me reiterate, we can measure constant volume heat capacity. If we measure temperature and volume changes that occur, we can measure this dt dv a constant u. And if we can measure the dt dv a constant u, we can use this expression to calculate the, the internal pressure of the substance under study. Now it turns out this partial derivative dt dv a constant u um, is actually given a name. Um, it's called the Joule coefficient, and it's represented by the Greek character mu with a J subscript, named after James Joule, 
an experiment he conducted, again we'll be talking about in a later video, in which he attempted to measure um, dTdV at constant U. Finally, there are two additional partial derivatives that we'll be talking about um, in later videos and using to do calculations. Uh, one is the expansion coefficient represented by the Greek character beta. And it's simply equal to the derivative of volume with respect to temperature under conditions of constant pressure. It's divided by volume, 1 over V, so that we're getting a fractional change that occurs. So what this partial derivative tells us, this dV dt at constant P, is how much uh, a substance expands when we change the temperature. So if we have a constant pressure process and we change the temperature, how will the volume change when we do that? So the expansion coefficient um, represents that. And of course we know that of course for any substance when you increase the temperature its volume is going to increase. Um, so we're going to see expansion when we increase the temperature of any substance, be it solid, liquid, or gas. And that means that partial derivative is always greater than zero. Um, you'll find tabulated values of this for solids and liquids in your textbook. There's another coefficient called the isothermal compressibility. Uh, in this case, it's related to the partial derivative, which uh, represents changes in volume when we change the pressure under isothermal conditions. So when you increase the pressure on substance, something, you of course know the volume is going to decrease. Um, and so increasing pressure decreases the volume, and that means that partial derivative is less than zero. Um, that explains why we have a negative sign here, uh, because a negative times a negative gives us a, a positive. And so this isothermal compressibility constant, given by the Greek character kappa, is always going to be greater than zero. Again, you'll find tabulated values of that in various thermodynamic tables or, in fact, in your, in your textbook. Okay, this ends our basic introduction to uses of partial derivatives in thermodynamic systems. Uh, we'll be discussing these and how to do specific calculations with these partial derivatives in future videos.